Well, good morning. Let's try it one more time. Good morning. That's better. Great to see you this morning. I don't know if you guys realize this, but the sun has come out this weekend. Uh, game changer, isn't it? My son came to me the other day. Dad, I have that disorder, you know, when it gets really cloudy and gray all the time where you're sad and depressed. And I said, seasonal effect of this disorder? He goes, yeah, whatever that is, I have it. I said, I think you're just tired. And sure enough, about 6.30 in the morning, he's going to school. So it was tough. But the sun is out. I hope and pray that just as the sun has illuminated uh, your life this morning, that the Lord Jesus would illuminate your heart as you have come to gather for worship today. Looking on the screen, just reminded of all the things that we do as a church, uh, different times of life from the young to the not so young. And uh, we're so grateful for how God has chosen to bless Geyer Springs and chosen to bless the ministries here. We're excited about the days ahead. And you walked in, received a worship guide, looks something like this. I invite you to go ahead and find that guide this morning. Inside that guide is uh, a lot of information about what's happening here at our church that'll be important for you as you try to understand Understand all the comings and goings and programs that are available here. Uh, do you want to make a mention of your very special guest today? Thank you for being with us. We realize you could have been a lot of different places this morning, but you've chosen to be here, and we're grateful for that. At the end of the service, I want to invite you to go to Guest Central. If you've not had a chance to do that, Guest Central is over in the lobby to my left as you exit uh, the worship center, and there our pastor will be there, and so we have a free gift just to say thank you for being with us, and it's a great place to uh, get information and meet some of our staff team as we'd love to get to know you. You. Inside that worship guide I mentioned, there is a little connection tab. I invite you to go ahead and tear that away right now. If you'll find some time in the service together this morning to fill that out for us, that's a great gift to us to know that you're here and know how we can serve you. There's a great place on there and how we can pray for you in the days ahead. And so our staff and our prayer team, very faithful to pray, as well as you might or be interested in some next steps at Geyer Springs. We would love to be able to offer that information to you. So if you want to fill that on the back side of that, letting us know uh, what information you'd like to have. And then this morning, this morning, you may be interested in making a decision that would impact your life for Jesus. We encourage you to fill that out as well. At the end of the uh, service today, the ushers will come down and receive an offering. If you'll push these tabs towards the middle, that would be a huge uh, help to us as we pick those up at that time. Well, this morning, the one thing we want to highlight today is our March for Life. This is an annual March for Life, Sanctity of Life Sunday, as we as churches and believers all across central Arkansas will be going to the state capitol steps this morning or this afternoon, and we'll be marching for life, sharing with our legislators, our community, and the public that we stand for life. And we invite you to come join us. We'll be uh, having a bus for those who are unable to drive. We'll be leaving here at 115. If you'd like to follow that bus, we'll be going uh, to the state capitol there, marching at 2 o'clock sharp up to the capitol steps. All that information is available inside the worship guide today. We invite you and your family. Great opportunity for your small group to get together and join hands, join hearts with other believers around Little Rock as we stand for life today. Well, we're so glad that you're here for worship. We're excited about what God will do in our small groups later, in our small groups uh, this week, as well as what's going on today. So thank you for being here with us.
the name of Jesus. He is the lion and the lamb. He's coming on the clouds. He's rolling. Sing it with us this morning. He's coming on the clouds. He's the kingdom's will bow down. And every chain will break. As broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God. Our God is the lion. The Lion of Judah, He's roaring with power, He's fighting our battles, every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world, His blood breaks the chains, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb, every knee will bow. So open the gates, make way for the King of Kings. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Our God who calls the same, is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord? Bring forth the 
Well, good morning. Good to see you this morning. So glad you have joined us for worship. We come to the point in our service where we uh, pray. Uh, before we pray, I want to remind you that if you're uh, reading through the New Testament with us, if you have a journal, we do have a memory verse each month. And so I want you to look. Do we have the memory verse uh, to pull up? It's Matthew chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. Why don't you read this with me? And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Got it, right? Yep. Let's try it again. Leave it. No, no, don't bring it up. Take it down. And he said to me, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Wow, was that up there? <laughs> that was impressive. You guys have done well. I love the way our memory verse fits into what we do at this point in the service, and that is we pray for the loss. In the last couple of weeks, we've had over 350 of you uh, turn in names of a person that you are diligently working at reaching this year, and we committed to pray with you. We've already started that with our staff team and our prayer times, and each uh, Sunday morning as we have opportunity, we're going to do that in the service as well. Let's put up the names for this morning. Uh, these are three that we're praying for today, Elijah, Jonathan, and Nick, and then you can see submitted by Pam Smith, Mary Gwynn, and Kim Garlington. So we want to pray not only for those who need to know Christ, but pray for these three who turn these names in because their commitment is as we join them in prayer, they're going to look for opportunity and be diligent in presenting the gospel. Let's take a moment this morning and bow if you would, and if you would just take a moment and lift up one of these three, Elijah, Jonathan, or Nick, and let's pray that the Lord be working in their lives this week, orchestrating opportunities, orchestrating encounters, helping them see their need for Christ. And let's pray that the Holy Spirit would be drawing them into relation with Christ. <coughs> and now let's lift up Pam and Mary and Kim and ask that the Holy Spirit would direct them and guide them, would make them aware of opportunity, would give them the words to speak when the time is right. Father, I thank you for a church body that is concerned about those who need to know Christ. I thank you for the compassion and the burden you've placed on so many hearts for a friend or a loved one, a neighbor, a coworker that needs Christ. And Father, this morning as we have lifted these up before you, we ask that you would be working in, in the lives of the one who needs you as well as the one who knows you. And Father, I pray that even this week you might orchestrate opportunities. Father, I thank you that we can count on you. Holy Spirit, that you have said you will give us the words to say. So I ask that you would do that. And Father, we look forward to what you're going to do this year through the life of this body in advancing the gospel. And we ask these things this morning in the mighty and powerful and trustworthy name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to His. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. He didn't want heaven without Him. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. Your love was great, your love was greater. What could separate? What a wonderful name. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. 
you're able to stand with us, let me invite you to stand as we continue to worship this morning. Proclaiming death could not hold him, the veil tore before him, silence the boast of sin and grain. Death could not hold him, the veil tore before him, he silenced the boast of sin and grain. Heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Oh, yours is the kingdom, yours is the love. name is beauty his name is wonderful just a reminder this morning before we share a new song with you guys this morning uh, this new song speaks of the mercies and the goodness of God which we've all experienced a reminder that all of our days we are held in his hand it reminds me of Psalm 23 starting in verse 4 it says even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for you are with me your rod and thy staff they comfort me and then skip to verse 6 surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever for all that he's done for me we will sing of the goodness of God proclaim what an awesome God he is amen, amen. I love you Lord oh your mercy never fails me all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God all my life. Sing it, church All my life you have been faithful Yes, you have
we sing of your goodness today. Father, as we worship you this morning from beginning to end, may it all point people to you. Father, you've been so good to us. Your mercies are new every morning. Father, you love us every step of the way that you take us on this journey of life. Father, we come today saying thank you. Not just a simple way to give you praise this morning with our voices, with our song, God, with a heart that's ready to hear from you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Be seated. As a pastor in Arkansas, I'm thankful to reside in the second most pro-life state in the nation, but I'm not willing to rest in that position. I've stood in this very place, 31 of the 32 Januaries I've lived in Arkansas. As long as God gives me strength, I'll continue to show up for the annual March for Life. But to be honest, I can't help but wonder if we are truly making progress. This past legislative session saw 11 pro-life bills passed. All of these bills place further regulations on abortion. But history has shown us that regulation has little to no effect on ending abortion. Over the past two years, I've had some encounters that have challenged me to rethink my position and have brought me to a paradigm shift. While I've been thankful for legislators in our state who recognize something must be done about abortion, I have come to realize that regulation cannot be our ultimate goal. Regulation will not get us to the goal line. The time has come for us to demand that abortion be abolished in our state. Whether you realize it or not, abolishing abortion in Arkansas is doable. In Acts 5.29, after coming into conflict with the Sanhedrin, Israel's governing body, Peter says, we must obey God, not men. Yes, we are under the authority of government established by God, but when the laws of man come into conflict with God's law, we must obey God. Clearly, abortion violates God's law. Every follower of Christ, every evangelical congregation, every pastor must stand on God's word and do what scripture commands. God's word is clear that all life is valuable from the moment of conception and that God expects us to protect all life. Abortion is not a political or social issue. It is a biblical issue, a moral issue. With that in mind, we are compelled to demand the total and immediate abolition of abortion in our beloved state. Can I challenge you as a pastor, as a church leader, as a Christ follower to commit to obey God's law and to defend the unborn, to rescue those being carried off to death? Let me ask you to prayerfully consider what you should do. Take a moment and visit the website abolishabortionar.com. There you can learn more about the movement to completely abolish abortion in Arkansas, and you can sign the petition and commit to protecting all of our precious preborn children. Join me and other godly leaders as we seek to abolish abortion in Arkansas. I didn't feel like you needed to see more of me on the screen, but on this Sanctity of Life Sunday, I wanted you to be aware that there is a, a paradigm shift in how we approach the issue of abortion. Uh, for 47 years, January 22nd this week will be the 47th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. For 47 years, the pro-life movement has tried to get legislators to pass laws, to regulate, to restrict abortion. That just isn't getting us anywhere. This last session, our state legislature passed 11 bills. Is that going to save some lives? Absolutely. But our goal needs to be to save all of the precious, innocent, unborn. So there's a grassroots movement. I was not aware of it till this last year, but I've gotten involved 
uh, cut that video for them at the state capitol to send out to other churches. There's a grassroots movement uh, in Arkansas to seek to abolish abortion in our state. Now, I'm not a legal expert, um, but there are some legal experts who have uh, studied the whole issue, have found precedent, and believe it's actually possible. In fact, there are several states, uh, as many as 12, that I'm aware of that are looking at the same issue, um, getting bills ready um, to put before their state legislatures. And I, I can't, I don't have time this morning to lay it all out for you. I've read it, I've studied it, be glad to have a conversation with it if you'd like to, but it's actually doable. Uh, we've never realized it before, but it's actually doable. Uh, for the state of Arkansas to say, we're not going to have abortion in our state regardless of what the federal government says, okay? So I want you to be aware of that. Um, you see the website on the screen, Abolish Abortion AR. There's some red cards like this on the counters out in the lobby. I just want to encourage you, if you understand as I do, that we've got to do more to protect these lives, to go to the website, uh, pick up a card, get a little bit of education, and signed a petition. What we need is enough signatures on this petition to go to the legislature and say, look, all of these folks who are residents of our state want this passed. Uh, there are some legislators that are very open. They're willing to sponsor the bill. Um, we believe the governor would be open to it as well, but they just need to hear from the people of Arkansas, this is what we want. So I want to challenge you to go to the website. Um, the video you just saw, or one similar to it, is on my Facebook page, is on the church Facebook page. You can uh, share it. Uh, you can ask your friends to sign the petition as well. But this is a, in my mind, just a phenomenal point we're coming to of recognizing that we can abolish abortion. Uh, most of the attorneys who are involved in, in drawing up the legislation believe if one of these states gets it passed, the others will just fall like dominoes. So we could see that happen uh, in, in our lifetime, which is something I never thought we would, we would come to. So I want you to consider that. And I pray about that. Looking forward to joining many of you on the march this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Well, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the time to come together as the body of Christ. And Father, we thank you especially for the privilege we have of opening your word each week and learning and taking what we learn each week and allowing your Holy Spirit to work it into our lives so that we can be the people that you have called us to be. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth. Father, thank you for this body who gathers week by week to worship you, to bring glory to your name in our worship, and also to bring glory to your name in the way we live when we're away from this place. Speak to us now, Spirit of God, who authored this book, and help us to hear and help us to obey. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we are journeying through the New Testament. Um, if you haven't been here the last couple of weeks, we as a church body are reading through the entire New Testament this year. It only takes five chapters a week. We just finished our second week, which was Matthew uh, 6 through 10. And we read through each week, and then we come uh, to that section of Scripture, and we look at a portion of that. This morning, our message comes from the closing verses of Matthew chapter 9. While you're turning there, let me mention that if you ordered a, a New Testament reading plan and you've not picked it up, you ordered a journal, they are out in the lobby on a table with your name on it. If you did not, you didn't know about this and you didn't order, there are enough copies that you can go by and pick up one that doesn't have a name on it and you can, you can join us in that. Let me also mention to families, there are family devotions, one a week. We don't expect you to try to wrangle your kids every night of the week, but one a week. And these also are on the countertops uh, out in the lobby. You can pick those up and have that uh, with your family. Matthew chapter 9, we'll be jumping in at verse 35. If you were looking through a photo album of, of Jesus' three years in ministry, Matthew 9, 35 would probably just be, it's a short section, just be a little snapshot, maybe tucked away in the corner of a, of a page of that photo album. But what we're about to read in Matthew 9, although it's a small snapshot, it, it's a transition taking place in the ministry of Jesus, and this transition has huge implications for the advancement of the gospel. Uh, you might consider this, and it probably is, as far as chronologi chronologically, it probably is, but you might consider this the midpoint of Jesus' ministry. Jesus has been teaching and preaching and performing miracles of compassion. The disciples have been with him, but they've just been observing. Occasionally, they would pull away after a season of ministry, and they would kind of debrief, and so they're, they're learning about the ministry. They're observing their learning, but now we're coming to the phase of discipling these men. You see, the task is too great because Jesus is in humanity at this point. He's in a human body. The task is too great. He can't do it alone. He's been preparing them, and now he's about to send them out. And a transition is going to take place. They're going to do more of the work of the ministry. 
They're going to be out there advancing the cause of the gospel. So read with me in Matthew <clears throat> chapter 9, beginning of verse 35. It says, And Jesus went through all, throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And then chapter 10 and verse 1. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. And then what you see in verses 2 through 4 is a listing of the 12. And then that first phrase in chapter 10 and verse 5 very simply says, these 12 Jesus sent out. All right, so here's the picture. Here's what's happening. We see in verse 35, it says, Jesus went throughout all the cities and all the villages. We know from the historian Josephus that in Galilee, there are about 204 uh, cities or towns and villages. A city would be a big uh, walled-in city like Jerusalem, and a town or village would be much smaller population, not, not a wall around it, a lot more rural. But Josephus tells us there were three, or 204 of these and 3 million people in the area just around Galilee. So Jesus is out. He's meeting people wherever they are. He's constantly out. He's engaging people. In fact, the words in Greek, the words went throughout, refer to a constant, unceasing effort. He was going all the time. He was expending all his energy in engaging people. Verse 35 tells us what he did when he engaged them, three key elements to his ministry. First, it says that he was teaching. Now, every Every town, every village, no matter how small, anywhere there was a, a, a population of Jewish people, there was a synagogue. When they came back from the Babylonian captivity, they began to set up these synagogues. The temple had been destroyed. Well, the synagogue literally was, was a school. It was a place that they went uh, to be taught. And they gathered on the second day of the week, and they gathered on the fifth day, and they gathered on the Sabbath, and then, of course, any feast or festivals, and, and listen to the order of a service in the synagogue. This is just like what we do today. First, they would have a time of thanksgiving and blessing, just like we do as we sing songs of thanks and songs of praise to the Lord as we gather for worship. They'd have a time of prayer. Then there'd be a time where someone would get up and, and read the Scripture. One of the teachers would read the Scripture. They'd read a section from the law, from Moses. They'd read a section from the prophets. And then they would interpret it for the people. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The people spoke Aramaic, so they would interpret or explain what it said. After that, there would be a sermon or a word of exhortation to those who were gathered there. And then finally, they would finish with a, a benediction or a, a prayer blessing before they left. Same pattern that we use. Uh, we believe in the church, it's vitally important, the most important part of that service is, is to teach the meaning of Scripture. The time of thanksgiving and blessing, the time of worship, prepares our hearts to receive from the Lord, and then we teach the meaning of Scripture. So verse 35 says he was teaching. Secondly, it says he was proclaiming. The word proclaim means to, to herald or to announce or to make a, a, a public proclamation. That didn't occur in the synagogue, that occurred out. That occurred on the streets and the highways, on the hillsides. That occurred when Jesus would encounter people out working the fields, uh, anywhere that they were in a village, anywhere that people were outside of the religious environment, the gospel was proclaimed. Everywhere Jesus went, he announced that the kingdom of God was coming, and then he told people how they could enter the kingdom of God. You know what we would call that today? We'd call that evangelism. And do you see the pattern there and the model there for us they gathered in the synagogue for instruction, but where did they go to evangelize? They scattered, they went out. Dr. Roy Fish, the late Dr. Roy Fish, used to say that evangelism in the church is terribly, it's like fishing in a bathtub. It's terribly convenient, but you don't catch much. We don't evangelize in here. I mean, you may bring lost friends or, or associates or, or family members here. They're going to hear the gospel, but typically evangelism occurs as we scatter. We come together to be taught, and then we scatter to proclaim the gospel. Verse 35 says he was teaching, he was proclaiming. Thirdly, you see there, it says that, that he was healing. Now, I don't know that Matthew listed this thirdly for a reason, but I would say it's good he listed it thirdly because really it's, it's third in importance. The miracles and the healing were not the main thing. 
If you read through this week in chapters 6 through 10, you notice that in chapters 8 and 9, there's miracle after miracle after miracle that Jesus did. There was the healing of the the leper. There was uh, Peter's mother-in-law who had been sick, the centurion servant, the demon-possessed man, the paralytic, the dead girl, the sick woman. All of these miracles. Now, those are just samples of the kind of miracles Jesus did. All of them cannot be recorded. In fact, in the very last chapter of the Gospel of John, the last verse of the last chapter, John says, listen, the world would not contain the books if we tried to write down all of the things that Jesus did. But the miracles, understand the miracles were not the main deal. Jesus didn't come just to do miracles. He came to teach. He came to proclaim. The miracles simply validated the Gospel message, validated who Jesus was. Why? Because his message was very different. His message was not like that. It was was actually contrary to the message of the religious leaders of his day. In fact, the religious leaders looked down on him. He's not a rabbi. He's not even been trained. And so the miracles convinced the people that he was God and that he had authority. You know, it's interesting. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, never denied the miracles that Jesus did. They couldn't deny it. Everybody saw it. So they didn't deny the miracles, but they denied the source. They said that Jesus did it because he had the power of Satan or Beelzebub. So Jesus went about, verse 35, he was teaching, he was proclaiming, he was healing. Verse 36 very simply says this, he saw the crowds. Now that saw is an important word. You know, Jesus saw the crowds because he was looking, right? But let me also say to you, you can look without seeing. How many of you wives recognize that you're married to someone who can look without seeing? You know what I'm talking about, right? Where's my son? All of our families here this weekend. My son Jordan, I, it skipped me, I'm, I'm perfect at this, but <clears throat> my son Jordan being a male has trouble seeing. When he was a boy, he'd holler down from his room Mom, I can't find whatever, my shoes, my backpack, whatever. She said, that's fine, but if I come up there and find it, it's mine for 24 hours. Well, miraculously, suddenly he was able to see. He'd been looking all over his room, but he couldn't see. Listen, you can look and not see. In Mark 8, there's a, there's a story of Jesus healing a blind man. You may remember the story. He, he touched the man, and the man was able to see, but when Jesus asked, what can you see? He said, I see people, but, but I see them as trees walking. His vision was blurry, so Jesus had to touch him a second time. That miracle was actually a rebuke to the disciples. He was showing them, hey, guys, you can see, you have vision, but your vision is not yet what it needs to be. You, you haven't got it. I wonder how many of us need a touch from Jesus to help us see, especially when it comes to the people around us. You know, a lot of times we don't even look. We have our head down. We walk by. Much like the priest and the Levite in the story of Good Samaritan. We don't want to look. We, av- we avoid people. Or we look over them or we look through them. You ever been at a function or a gathering and somebody's talking to you and you can tell they're looking through you and looking over you? They, they don't care. How about this? You ever do this? I'm admitting my own faults here, but you ever do this? Somebody standing on a street corner or somewhere else or even within the church, some person that you know is a needy person headed your way and you're saying this in your mind, don't make eye contact. <laughs> right? So what do we see when we look at people? We might see their color. We might see their socioeconomic status. We might see their situation. We might see their problems, the messiness in their life. I guess the question is, can we look at them at, like Jesus did? Can we, can we see their spiritual potential? Or, or when we look at them and, and we see the incredible needs they have, could we possibly envision that God might use us to, to meet those needs? In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul, in that, sec- in that fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, talking about the ministry we have as believers, the ministry of reconciliation, Paul says about himself that he was compelled to share the gospel because of what Christ had done for him, because of Christ's willingness to love him and, and to die for him. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, he says this, talking about recognizing what Christ had done for him, he says this, from now on, 
we regard no one from a worldly point of view. You know what he's saying? I, I can't look at people anymore from a human perspective when I understand what Christ has done. I can't look through temporal eyes and look at people and think, well, how well do they perform or what are they worth or, or, or are they like me or is their life kind of messy? I can't look at them that way when I understand the eternal perspective. Our willingness to advance the gospel should affect what we see. Let me say that a, a more simple way. Our business affects our vision. Let's suppose that you were going out on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon drive, and let's suppose that you're a painter. You know what you notice as you drive by houses and different buildings? Paint job. What if you're a landscaper? You notice the landscape. If you're an architect, you, you look at the architecture. Your business affects what you see. And so the question for us is, as followers of Christ, what's our business? What's your business? What, what do you see when you look out at the community where you live? When we were working down into the interior of Mexico and also in Peru, we would take teams in and the first trip, we would always make sure that we had adequately covered, adequately covered the area where we were working by prayer walking. And, and part of prayer walking was helping people understand, you're not just walking down the street praying, you're walking down the street praying with your eyes open. And I don't, I don't mean your eyes open just so you don't trip and fall, you're praying with your eyes open to see what you need to pray about. As you're walking through these little villages, you're looking to see What's hanging on the clothesline? That tells you something about who's in that house. You're looking to see if there are toys in the yard. You're looking to see if there are farm implements uh, leaning against the side of the, the house. What do we see? Verse 36. He was out among the people. He saw them. And what did he see? He saw that they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Your translation may say that they were faint and distressed. Uh, in, in the Greek, those words, harassed and helpless or faint and distressed, are describing not a one-time thing, but a, a continual condition. What do the words mean? The first word, harassed, in the Greek means this, torn, mangled, whipped, beaten harshly, skinned, mutilated, and battered. And then the helpless word simply means they were exhausted, they were worn out after being beaten and, 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 and battered, they were thrown down. And so the picture Jesus has is, he, he describes as he looks at these people, he pictures them as a flock of sheep on the hillside. And wild animals have come and, and, and ravaged the flock and attacked the flock, and there was no shepherd there to protect them. And after the attack was over, and they'd been mangled and beaten and skinned and mutilated and, and thrown down, there's no shepherd there to pick up the pieces. There's no shepherd to bind up their wounds. There's no shepherd to lead them to safety. And that's what he saw when he saw the people. And listen, I, I don't know if you, you would conceive this, but in my mind, that's a picture of our culture and the condition of people in our culture. They may not look like that with our physical eyes, with our spiritual eyes, we would see that they are harassed and they are helpless like sheep without a shepherd, and they need someone to come along and, and with compassion bind up their wounds and lead them to safety. Go back to verse 36 and look at the phrase I skipped. He saw the crowds, he saw they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So he had seen them, he had observed their condition, but, but what was it that made him do something? He was moved by compassion. Now in verse 35 we mentioned that, that the miracles of healing validated the gospel, but there's a second reason for these miracles, and I call them the miracles of compassion. The second reason is Jesus was trying to demonstrate to the people the loving and caring heart of God. You see, the Pharisees had not taught them that God was compassionate and sympathetic and loving and, and, and filled with kindness. They hadn't taught them that. And the Greeks, all of their gods, the Greeks would describe their gods with one word, apathetic. Their gods didn't care about them. They, they knew that. And so Jesus came not only to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, he didn't just teach the word and, and proclaim the gospel. He touched people where they were hurting. He was sympathetic and he was caring. 
his actions, he was trying to teach them about God. You know that most people in our culture today don't know that God is a compassionate God? And if you study the world religions, you'll find something very interesting, and that is this. Our God is the only God that has compassion. No other gods in any world religions have the compassion that our God has. And what I'm saying to you as a church is that we have to understand the need for compassion, for people to see compassion, if they're going to truly understand the gospel. That's why, you know, some of you have been on these international mission trips with us. That's why we do so many things of serving people and meeting their needs. It's not because we practice a social gospel where we just take care of people's needs and hope they do okay. No, we do that to open the door to the gospel message. We run a medical clinic. We don't just take care of their needs. Every person that comes through that clinic, before they leave, hears the message of the gospel. They hear it after their needs have been taken care of. Because they understand that we are serving a compassionate God and we are serving them in compassion because that's who God is. You remember what Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak with tongues of men and angels but have not love, what am I doing? I'm just making a bunch of noise. Paul says, without love, I am nothing. So Jesus had compassion. You know that Jesus understood our suffering because of his humanity. You think about that. God is a compassionate, loving God, but then God takes on a human body, and so he has the personal experience of physical pain. He has the personal experience of rubbing up against people who are needy while he's in a human body. What motivated Jesus when he saw these crowds was, was compassion. Now, I don't know how you define compassion, but I, but I think for most of us, maybe our, our, our definition's a little bit shallow. Compassion to us means that, that we feel sorry for someone. Or we kind of look at their situation and say, oh, I mean, that's a shame. And then we move on. The Greek word for compassion is splonknizomai. Would you say that with me? Let, me? let me give it to you a bit at a time. <laughs> Splunk. Ni. Zo. My. Splunk ni zo my. That just sounds messy, doesn't it? You made a mess of it when you said it. You know, it sounds messy because it is. That Greek word in talking about confession refers to the bowels. I'm just telling you, I'm not making this up. It means to feel something in the, in the bowels or the intestines or, or the stuff in the middle. When, when the Greeks felt something very deeply, something that brought them pain, they expressed that hurt or that pain in their midsection. Now, if you think about it, it makes a lot more sense than, than what we do. We talk about the heart, right? Oh, that just really hurt my heart, or that blessed my heart. But where do you feel emotion? You, you don't have butterflies in your heart, do you? You have them where? In your stomach. Now, man, I'm not suggesting that you go home to tell, tell your wife this evening that you love her with all of your bowels. I'm not suggesting that at all. <laughs> Just saying they had a little bit better way of expressing the emotion. Okay, so here's Jesus, God in a bod. He sees the condition of the people. He's a loving, caring, compassionate God. You know, when you put God, who's that loving and that caring and that compassionate, far beyond what we ever would be, when you put him in a body and he sees that kind of need, that's going to wreak havoc on his body. Jesus literally was, was physically sick, sickened by, by what he saw. And today you and I are Jesus to our culture. And, and I've come to recognize if the condition of, of, of the people in our culture who don't know Christ, if their condition doesn't disturb me, doesn't move me with compassion, I better be alarmed about my own relationship with the Lord. We are called, all of us, not just pastors, to minister, to proclaim the gospel out of love and out of compassion we're called to explain the gospel out of hearts that are broken over the condition of the loss. Now, of course, 
Jesus' concern, his compassion, was not just about their physical needs. It was about their, their spiritual need. And again, we meet physical needs to open the door to spiritual needs. Jesus' primary mission is very simple. He came to seek and save the lost. It wasn't about the miracles. It wasn't about the, the compassionate miracles. It was about getting the gospel message across. But he understood that people needed to know that God loved and cared for them if they were going to believe the eternal message of the gospel. Well, so what does he do? Verse 37 and 38, he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, I want you to understand that harvest, that word harvest has two facets to it. Most uh, commentators would say the word harvest here is referring to uh, when, when he says the harvest is plentiful, the abundant number of people who need the gospel, who are ripe for harvest, they're ready for the gospel, someone just has to go out and share with them. But understand in Scripture that harvest also refers to judgment. And you'll see that repeatedly through Scripture, that the word harvest is referring to the judgment that's going to come at the end of time. In fact, you remember the parable that Jesus told about the man who planted wheat, and he had this wheat crop, and his laborers come into him one day and say, hey, all these weeds have sprung up in the crop. And the landowner said, well, clearly an enemy came during the night and, and sowed weeds in the crop. And so the laborers say, well, do you want us to pull all the weeds up? And he said, no. You may pull some wheat, leave them, let them grow together, and at the harvest time, we'll bundle up the wheat and put it into my barn, and the weeds we will bundle up and throw into the fire. Harvest is also a picture of, of judgment. Judgment is coming, and that's why Jesus told them to pray, and you notice he said, pray earnestly. There's going to be, for those who are not in Christ, great grief and great sorrow. And when Jesus saw these people who didn't know him, who didn't hear, hadn't heard the gospel message, when he saw them, he saw not only their current problem, he saw the eternal perspective. The harvest is, is the mission field, and the harvest is the final judgment. And he's calling the disciples to pray for more workers to get out into that harvest. Paul, again, back in 2 Corinthians 5, in that chapter on our ministry of reconciliation, Paul said this, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Understanding the judgment that is going to fall when, when harvest time comes for our world. Understanding the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, we, we beg men, we plead with men to be reconciled with God because of the harvest that is to come. So Jesus says to them, pray earnestly. You know, when we really get the picture of the harvest, of the judgment that's coming, when we really see the people around us in our community and our, our family and our friends and our coworkers and our uh, people we go to school with, when we see the condition those people are in, when that really comes to us and we get the picture, we're going to be overwhelmed. We're going to feel like we got to hurry up and, and we got to do something. we got to get busy. we got to come up with a plan. But he didn't say any of that. What did he say to do? He said to, to pray. Why? Because we can't do anything apart from prayer. We, we don't have the plan. We don't have a clue. Prayer is the, the program and the plan and the work. It starts there. That's why we're committed to praying for these 350 plus names. Praying for those who are trying to reach a friend or a neighbor with the gospel. But look what he said, pray. Pray. He doesn't say pray for the lost, does he? He says pray for laborers. Okay, now, he's talking to the disciples. You think they know who the laborers are? It's them. Pray for laborers. He is saying pray for more laborers, but he's also saying pray for yourself. So here's what might happen. You turn in a name a couple of weeks ago, and you begin to pray for someone to get the gospel to your friend or your loved one. And you keep praying. And you pray consistently, and you pray fervently. And while you're praying for the gospel to get to that friend or loved one, you have this thought. Maybe I should take the gospel to them. 
That's why Jesus told them to pray for the laborers, to pray for themselves, that they will be burdened enough that they will do something to get the gospel out to that friend or loved one. I always think about the old deacon. pastor told the story on one of his men, this old deacon, and every time the pastor would call on him to pray at the end of the service, he would always finish his prayer with, Lord, touch the unsaved with thy finger. One night, old deacon's called on to pray. He's praying that prayer. Lord, touch the unsaved, and then he just stops, and it's silent, and it gets uncomfortable. And finally, the pastor looks, wondering, has this guy had a stroke? What's happened? And the man's just standing there, and he walks, the pastor walks back to him, brother, are you okay? He said, the Lord just told me, you are the finger. You see, when we pray, when we pray for the laborers in the harvest field, as we pray that God will send someone, then we begin to realize, well, well maybe I should go. You see, it's easy to pray and not get involved, but prayer should lead to involvement. Prayer should lead us to say, I'm willing to get dirty. I'm willing to get in the mess of their lives to bring the gospel to them. That's what Jesus did. Jesus was a high-touch shepherd. He's, He's God. All he has to do is speak the word. All these people that he healed, he didn't have to touch them. Those lepers, that incredibly infectious disease, Jesus did not have to touch them to heal them. All he had to do was speak the word, be healed, and they would be healed. But if you read through the Gospels and see when Jesus was performing these miracles of compassion, he didn't just speak the word. He touched people. He was willing to get involved in the, in the mess of their lives. And then you notice in chapter 10, in that first verse, he got the disciples around him, gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every disease and affliction. Basically, he gave them authority to do the same thing he was doing. And then down in verse 5, he sent them out. Praying for the laborers didn't re- release them from the obligation. They weren't to pray for laborers so that they could stay and hang around Jesus and hear the teaching and sing Kumbaya. That's that's not why they were praying for laborers, because he's sending them out as laborers. Don't, Don't pray for anything you're not willing to do. Don't pray for God to send someone to reach your friend or your loved one if you're not willing to share the gospel with them. Don't pray. The old preacher said, when a farmer prays for a corn crop, God expects him to say amen with a hoe in his hand. Pray if you're not willing to do it. So he says what? Pray for the Lord of the harvest. Look at this. To send out laborers into his harvest field. You know what send out? The, The word send out is a very powerful word. It literally means to thrust out. And it's the same word that's used when Jesus cast a demon or demons out of someone. It's a powerful word. It means to thrust out. He's saying, pray that the Lord of harvest will shove some people out into the harvest field. Now, the workers, it's it's two things there, the laborers. It'll be some new laborers that that the Lord sends out. They'll be today, if, if you listen to the Spirit of God, there'll be today some of you who say, Boy, it's time for me to get out in the harvest field. I've not done that before. So there'll be some new laborers that get sent out. But you know, the other thing is we pray for laborers to be sent in the harvest field as we pray for ourselves. It's also some workers who are already out in the field. They've been in the field, but they've turned back to worldly comforts. And we're praying that God shoves them or thrusts them back out, that he lights a fire under them to thrust them back out into a world of need. Can God not work with just a few laborers? Absolutely. He doesn't need us. Don't think you're the greatest thing that ever happened to evangelism. You're you're God's gift to a lost world. He doesn't need us. Perhaps it's just that God doesn't want us to miss the blessing of going out in the fields with him. Pretty simple message. Let me give you some very clear application. Four questions. Number one, am I out and around people? I don't just mean that you're out in the community and and shopping and getting gas and going to eat. I mean, are you like Jesus? It was a constant, unceasing effort to get around people and rub shoulders with people, hoping to have the opportunity to speak truth. Second, 
How's my vision? When you're out and around people and you're engaging the world, are you looking or are you seeing? Paul said, from now on, we regard no one from the worldly point of view. You may need to pray that Jesus gives you the kind of spiritual vision you need to have when you, when you look at people that you might see. Third, how's your compassion? Does the condition of people without Christ really disturb you? And does it disturb you enough, you're willing to get your hands dirty, you're willing to get messy, you're willing to get involved in their complicated life issues because it disturbs you to not only see the condition they're in, but to know what eternity holds. Number four, are you praying? And as you pray, are you preparing? Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send more laborers into his harvest field. Doesn't release us from the responsibility. We, we want to pray for new workers. But we want to pray for those of us who already have been or should have been out in the harvest field. Would you pray with me this morning? These men, these 12 we just read about in Matthew 9, those men and their spiritual offspring were Jesus' plan for continuing his ministry to a lost world. He, he left it in their hands. Those disciples and their spiritual offspring, the disciples that would follow them, that, that's us. So we're part of his plan. And I guess the question this morning, first of all, is do, do we believe that the harvest is plentiful? Do we believe that there are people out there ready to receive the message of the gospel? Do we believe that a judgment is coming on those who don't know Christ? How's your vision? It may be you just need to ask the Lord today that your commitment, your response to the message today is, Lord, I need you to help my vision. Touch my eyes so that I can see clearly. How's your compassion? You know, I've told you before, I, I struggle with getting dirty. That's what's hard for me about mission trips to third world countries. But it's, it's not really so much about getting physically dirty, is it? It's about being willing to get dirty because people have such a need spiritually we'll have to get into their lives we'll have to get into the mess every time I read this passage in Matthew 9 about Jesus having compassion I think back to Nehemiah you remember we studied Nehemiah in the fall and when the word came to him about the condition of the people he wept and mourned and fasted and prayed for days he couldn't eat he couldn't sleep he was so disturbed oh to be that disturbed about someone who doesn't know Christ Are you praying? And as you pray, are you preparing? As you're praying for the one that you know who needs Christ, are you preparing as a laborer who's going to be sent? What's the Spirit of God said to you today? How do you need to respond? Just a moment, we'll stand and we will sing together. This will be our response time. If you're here this morning, you don't know Christ. You're, you're one of those that Jesus looks at with an incredible heart of compassion, not just for the needs you have in this life, but for the needs you have for eternity. There are going to be pastors standing across the front of these sections. 
You can slip down any aisle and just slide in next to one of those pastors and let them tell you what it means to have a relationship with Christ. The vast majority of you here this morning know Christ. You've heard the word, what has the Spirit spoken to your heart? How do you need to respond? We're here if you need someone to pray with you or someone to give you wise counsel. But all across this room, all of us need to consider what we need to do in light of what the Lord has said. Father, thank you for speaking. I pray that not only these moments of response, but that you would continue to speak that we would be receptive and responsive and obedient to what you call us to. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing together? Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb would rescue the soul? Oh, you rescue the soul of man. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace. Our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always. seated if you would. Let me ask our men to come as we prepare to receive our offering this morning. If you filled out a connection tab, if you just pass that to either aisle, they will pick that up as they come. Let me thank our church family again for your faithfulness in giving. The way that we get laborers to the harvest field and support laborers on the harvest field, not just here but around the world, is because of your faithful giving. So thank you for that. Father, thank you for your blessing in our lives. Thank you for the way that you have blessed us in so many ways. And Lord, we recognize you bless us to be a blessing. We ask this morning that you would take the gifts, the tithes, the offerings that are given. You would help us uh, as church leadership, to be faithful in our stewardship. And Father, I pray that you would use these gifts to further the message of the gospel, not only here, but around the world. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.
it's hard to understand I will run to you my shelter I'm safe within your hands Oh you are my help forever I will not fear God you
that is our prayer today. When everything fails, our flesh, our circumstances, Lord, you are enough and you are powerful. God, we trust you with everything we have. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Some Sundays we have two sermons. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Brennan. Just a quick reminder, we love you guys. We're so grateful for your presence. And we encourage you this new year. Sometimes we think about New Year's resolutions being involved and engaged in small groups. You've not been a part of a small group. We would love to connect you to a community of people who want to pray for you, love for you, and encourage you in the faith. Please stop by the Connection Center on your way out as you receive that. If you're a guest today, stop by the Guest Central. We would love to meet you there. You are dismissed today. Thank you so much for joining us online today. As we looked at the harvest and the fact that the harvest is ripe, I hope you were challenged to get out and get to work in the harvest fields. If something in the message today spoke to you and you'd like to speak with one of our pastors or have someone to pray with, you can contact us at the information on your screen. Let me also ask you to consider joining us again next week, either online or here live on our campus. Our blended service meets at 930 in the Worship Center. Hope to see you then.